like to introduce the speaker is Chris O'Connell. Chris has been a member of our group for a number of years <coughs> and a former student of mine when I was teaching at Northeastern. Um, it right there? I really screwed up his mind badly. Right there. Third line there. Yeah. Well, I'm looking anyway, here. you can have it. Thanks, Jerry. So, showing up over here, that's so tonight I'm going to talk about two open source uh, oh, intrusion detection installed. systems. Right. Well, and I just wanted to see a show of hands to start out with. How many people are using intrusion detection technology in their office right now? Okay. Less than I expected. I did a... Um, I assume they are, but they wouldn't tell me if they were. That, that thought had crossed my mind. Um, <coughs> I did a, a, an unofficial survey of the Boston Windows Server Group and got about a 50% yes response on the intrusion detection technology. But again, some people don't want to answer either way for that question, so. <clears throat> All right, so big news this week. There's been a ton of security breaches. These are a couple. Uh, the big one this week, everyone heard about Zappos, right? Yeah. Okay. 24 million records got compromised from Zappos. And that number should tell you that whoever had compromised the records was in the system for a long time before being noticed. So the question is, how does someone stay in the system without being noticed that long? And how would you know if someone got into your system and got past your firewall? Did you have any method of knowing that they were there, any way of telling? <coughs> so I found uh, this model in the O'Reilly book from 2004, and it outlines the anatomy of an attack using the five Ps. The model is a little bit dated, but it's still pretty relevant. So the first step is to probe a network. And the probing could be something such as a port scan, a uh, social engineering attempt, dumpster diving, very basic uh, network recon that they would use to make an entrance into your system. And the second step is the penetration of your network, using the recon that they got in the first step to enter. The third step, according to the O'Reilly model, is uh, persistence. So once someone enters your network, they want to make sure they don't have to go through steps one and two again. Um, they want to be able to create a back door so that they can enter easily. That could be opening an RDP port or creating a user account that will allow them to log in at will when they want undetected. <coughs> the fourth step, according to their model, is the propagation. So once they've taken control of a resource on your network, they want to take more control, do more recon, find more resources that they can harvest. Uh, the propagation is dangerous because once one system in the network has been compromised, there's an implied trust that goes along with it. For example, if your terminal server is compromised, it may have an implied trust with the exchange server, and therefore it makes the propagation much easier for an intruder. And the last step, which is the one I kind of think is, is dated the most, is paralyzing the network. The O'Reilly model's been updated. It doesn't really mean like doing damage anymore. It more means stealing the network data, um, performing the actual hijack. So these are the steps according to O'Reilly of an intrusion attempt. And the first two can be thwarted pretty easily um, if your firewall is well programmed and if your IT security policy is well documented uh, and well enforced. And the IT security policy, I mean by that, um, network complexity for passwords, patches, software updates, firmware fixes, um, the basic things that go along with your written information security policy. But the question is, once someone gains entrance and they're at step three, how do you know? They've gotten around your first line of defense. Do you have any method of knowing that they're in there if they're not doing something noticeable? And for the last three steps of this model is where really intrusion detection and prevention play a huge role. They'll help you detect any strange network traffic, uh, anomalous attempts at people creating accounts and that sort of thing. So we'll start out with what is a network intrusion detection system? Wait a minute, can I interrupt? Sure. Uh, does anybody need me to adjust the lights down so that uh, you can see the screens better from back there? Having a choice of two screens actually helps them. Okay. Yeah, for the people over in that. Let's go here. Okay, so the lights aren't? No. Okay, it's fine. Okay, good. Is that a new system? 
Yeah, yeah, I don't remember a second screen before. Oh, it's, we've had that for a while in, in all the rooms here. Just that table, too. So yeah, what is just the table. So what is an IDS? So this came from Wikipedia, and they define an IDS system or an intrusion detection system as a software application or appliance that monitors network traffic for malicious activities and looks for policy violations. And sometimes it's called an IDS, or sometimes it's called a NIDS, a network intrusion detection system. The two key phrases on this slide are malicious activities. We kind of know what that is. Port scans, virus activity, that sort of thing. But policy violations is a little bit more specific. And a good example of a policy violation might be the new Massachusetts state law that determines you can't send social security numbers via email unless it's encrypted. Um, another, another example of that might be um, if you work for a financial firm, you probably don't want your users using Dropbox and storing sensitive financial files out there. So those would be examples of policy violations. And a good intrusion detection system is going to detect that sort of, a, that sort of traffic for you and help you comply with your own written policy. So we talked a little bit already about what you would actually use an intrusion detection system for, but it's used to monitor and alert you to policy violations and suspicious activity. Uh, it's good at identifying known attack patterns, pings and sweeps, attempts at uh, mapping your network using automated tools, <coughs> identifying suspicious network activity and scanning for policy violations. It's also very good at detecting uh, malware and worm infiltration, even if your virus scanners miss it because it's actually scanning network traffic, not just files on your, on your server. So if it detects traffic being transmitted, um, it will alert you to that. And then two excellent uses for a good intrusion detection system is getting to know your network better. <coughs> and as soon as you turn on an intrusion detection system and let it run for a week, you're going to get a really good view of all sorts of things going on in your network that you probably didn't see before. Uh, servers communicating with each other, workstations, transmitting data back and forth. Uh, so it will give you a very good snapshot of your network's health and security <coughs> concerns of it as soon as you turn it on. And the last bullet is post-attack analysis. So if your system has been compromised, you come in the next day, how did they get in? What did they take? Um, where, did the de where did the information end up? What was the destination IP? That's post-attack analysis. And the intrusion detection system can help you with that as well. <coughs> so the intrusion detection system also has something uh, called an intrusion detection and prevention system which is sort of an add-on or a different way of configuring an intrusion detection system. Uh, so what can an intrusion detection and prevention system do? It allows you to take proactive countermeasures against um, suspicious activity. So for example, if it detects something suspicious, So if it detects something suspicious, it can drop the connection, it can reprogram the firewall to start blocking ports, and it can launch a counterattack. So this is a good method of stopping uh, an intrusion from taking place once it's detected, and it's, uh, it's automatic. This diagram shows that in visual terms, the difference between an intrusion detection system running in just monitor mode and a system that's running in what they call inline mode or prevention mode. So the upper portion of the diagram shows the traffic flowing from the internet to the firewall, and then from the firewall to the LAN, and there's an IDS just sitting there sort of collecting data, not really in line, but just listening. The lower half of the diagram uh, shows the same scenario, except the traffic from the firewall runs through the intrusion detection system before it hits the LAN. And for this configuration, you would need two dedicated network cards, one to connect both segments of the network, and that's how, the, that's how the system will disconnect traffic. It will drop it as it passes through the IDS. So if it detects something suspicious, it will drop it at that point. So how does the IDS work? Um, it, uses, it looks for known good versus known bad traffic. Does anyone know how to shut off the timing on, this, on the PowerPoint? Seems to be a timing for the checkbox. 
So it looks for known good versus known bad traffic. And there's really three methods that it can detect problematic traffic. The first method is rules-based. And rules-based is very similar to the way your antivirus works. Packets are sent to the IDS system, and they're scanned based against a series of rules, just like an antivirus system. And just like an antivirus system, the rules need to be updated from time to time. The second method is a stateful protocol analysis, where it attempts to pick up uh, malformed protocol uh, transmissions. This one is tricky because a lot of people who write software don't strictly adhere to protocol standards, so monitoring for just protocol analysis errors will generate a lot of uh, false alarms. And the last method is anomaly-based detection, which is kind of the most interesting. You plug the interesting <coughs> detection system into your network, and it learns your network over the course of a week or two and detects what is normal traffic based on your network and then looks for variances in that behavior. Almost all IDS systems use some kind of rule-based because the rules are really easy to update, much more easy than updating a protocol analysis. There's a couple of pieces of terminology with IDS systems. Uh, we have a false positive. And a false positive is when the, dis when the system detects something that's problematic. That actually is just kind of normal noise. And workstations are notorious for generating false positives because they're on the web all day, and they visit sites with malformed JavaScripts and HTML pages that don't comply to standards. And these sorts of things are picked up as problems, even though they're just kind of the norm, given how badly written they are sites problems. are. They are Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, what can you do? Shut them in the mouth, so. <laughs> so step forward to that. Yeah, Black up the net. <laughs> so unfortunately, you can't really eliminate false positives altogether. And the reason why is because then you would create what's called a false negative. And a false negative is really human error. It's when you walk in and you see there's a thousand what you think are false positives, and you're really tired of seeing them all day, so you just delete them all. The problem with that is that these alerts are contextual. So what's normal from a workstation during normal business hours might be very abnormal coming from a server at 3 o'clock in the morning. So you have to be aware of that before you start uh, deleting things. You don't want to create any false negatives. A couple of other things. There's an, a couple of methods of uh, evading an IDS system. There's really two ways. The first way is the noisy way. And in this way, there are a couple of programs, I've listed them in parentheses, that are designed to overwhelm the resources of an intrusion detection system, either overload the CPU, run them out of disk space, run them out of memory, or send more data to the IDS system than the IDS system can process. And this is a very common method of trying to evade an IDS system. And it's bad because the system will crash if a program like this is used against it. But it's good because at least you know something happened. So you come in and your IDS system has crashed, and now you know that there's a reason for it. The second way is much more dangerous, where someone gets into your system and they don't make a lot of noise, and they kind of try to fly below the radar. And I think what we've been seeing with Zappos and the other security breaches that we've seen lately are that people tend to go with the second method, and that that's much more dangerous. People get in, they're in there for a long time undetected, and they get what they need over the course of weeks. And an IDS sensor, I just wanted to define what this is. An IDS sensor can be an appliance or a computer that plugs into the network and it listens for network traffic and it does all the processing and runs the packets against the rules and then it hands off what it finds to a server to log them for alerts. And we'll talk a lot about IDS sensors and where they're placed and what they're so what is SNORT? Well, SNORT is an intrusion detection system. Um, it's a packet sniffer and a packet logger, which is kind of a boring use for it since we have a million different types of these programs out there. It's much better as an intrusion detection and prevention system. Um, it is rule-based. It's open source. It uses the GPL license. The server for SNORT can run on Linux, Mac, and Windows. I tried it on Linux and Windows, and wouldn't recommend running it on Windows. Uh, 
There is also a, a, a modified version that's available commercially <coughs> through SourceFire. And the entry level SourceFire intrusion detection system costs $15,000 list price. On top of that, you can anticipate spending 18% per year for support, rules, and warranty on it. <coughs> so you can buy that, and it's really great. Uh, or you can get this one that's free, that's pretty good. And the rules have to be updated on Snort here and there. The rules do have a cost to them. If you want the newest rules, you have to pay $500 a year per IDS sensor that you have deployed. If you don't need the newest rules, every month, last month's rules become free. So if you think you can afford to run a month behind, you can get the rules completely free and, and use the system for no cost at all. So Snort is a signature-based uh, detection system, and it has something called preprocessors, which allow for some anomaly detection. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the preprocessors in a moment. Next are two key pieces of um, technology that need to be in place for an IDS sensor to function. The network device immediately upstream of where Snort is running has to be using port mirroring. And the reason for this, it, it dates back a long time, but back 20 years ago, most of our networks used hubs. And hubs were not very good. A packet that was transmitted on a hub was sent to every port on that hub. It caused collisions and slow transmissions. And it was actually a really big security hazard because someone who was snooping could come up and plug their laptop in and all the traffic on the whole hub would be sent to their laptop or their computer. So now we use switches, and switches are a lot smarter. They direct the traffic to the port that it's destined for. So if I took my laptop in and I tried to plug it into a switch and listen, I would miss almost everything because most of the traffic wouldn't hit my switch port. So the solution is that we need to enable port mirroring. And what port mirroring does is it says all the data that's transmitted and received on one port needs to be sent to this other port. And that other port is where you would plug in your IDS sensor. So second what, requirement what is if you've got a fast enough hub sitting in the drawer, you could just toss that in. You can do that too. Uh, but you know, hubs are getting harder to find, I think. So but yeah, you can you can do that. Well, the ones that, that you can find are slow. Right. So that's an option, too. But the poor mirroring is pretty easy. Sorry, uh, does Snort also support an inline mode? Like you said that is? It does, and I haven't used it, so I'm not that familiar with it. But we can talk about it a little bit. Maybe someone here has some experience with it that they can, that they can share. There are also some pretty cheap switches now that do port mirroring. I know that um, Netgear, uh, one of their Pro Safe line, like, Five port switch had port mirroring on it. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I usually configure the port mirroring. So, um, so the second requirement for the IDS sensor is that the network card has to be in promiscuous mode for this to work. And the reason for that is that uh, normally traffic sent to a network card will be discarded if that traffic isn't destined for the network card. So if I plug my laptop into a switch port and there's a lot of traffic coming to it that's not destined for my laptop, the NIC card will say, hey, get rid of this. I don't want to look at it. Promiscuous mode says, all the traffic that hits my port, I want to send that traffic up the communication stack to be processed. So these two uh, bullets are really important for deploying an IDS sensor. You kind of have to know how to turn on port mirroring and how to enable promiscuous mode in the network. IDS sensor placement is also very important. If you place the sensor in the wrong spot, you're going to get a whole lot of nothing. So you need to, you need to know how to identify your network choke points and plug your IDS sensors into those choke points appropriately. And after we've done all of those things, the packets will start to be captured and processed. And this is um, the packet capturing flow chart. And the reason that I wanted to show you this is it looks really big and long and complicated, and it kind of is. And this is the reason that an IDS evasion system is so effective at overwhelming an IDS system. Every packet has to run through this flow chart. And if you're talking uh, 1,000 megabits a second, that's a lot of processing power. So the first part of the flow chart shows that it's using PCAP to capture the packets. And then the packets are handed to a decoder 
And this big square, I like it because it looks complicated, but all it's really doing is saying, what type of traffic is this? We need to categorize this traffic. And it puts it in a category. And then it's handed to the preprocessor. The preprocessor is the most important part of Snort. It tries to normalize the, the packets so that the detection rules have the best method of being accurate. Uh, so if it picks up fragmented packets, it will reassemble them and then hand them to the rules instead of sending a partial packet to the rules and you might not get a, an accurate result. The preprocessors are also used as a self-defense mechanism for Snort. There are a bunch of preprocessors specifically designed to thwart IDS evasion techniques. And as a developer, the preprocessors are a spot for you to insert code that you need to run before the rules are detected. So they're really a key element in the, in the packet processing. And then the detection engine runs. The detection engine contains 18,000 rules right now. So normally you would think every packet has to go through 18,000 rules. Wow, that's a lot of processing power. But actually, because of the decoder, the packets have been categorized. And based on that category is how the detection engine decides what rules to run it against. So the decoder is really important to make sure that you're not overusing your CPU and it's keeping things <coughs> running nicely. And the last part of the flowchart just shows what happens with the packets in the end. Are the packets okay? If they are, pass them off. Uh, if not, then we can alert or log on. So talking about the IDS sensor placement, it's really important to know how to identify network choke points. I hope the two red arrows didn't give away my choke points because I was gonna ask you guys what they were. Uh, port one is the uplink to the firewall and port 24 to the workstation switch. So that would naturally make uh, two good spots that you might wanna monitor. Uh, I had someone ask me, um, why would we want to monitor the workstations <coughs> as opposed to just the traffic coming in and out of the firewall? Anyone know why that might be? Sending stuff back out? That could be one reason. There's actually a bunch of reasons going. Because that's how a lot of, that's how a lot of the viruses get in because it's <coughs> users who aren't quite as savvy as the administrators <coughs> might be. Yeah. How about a physical uh, intrusion attempt where I walk into someone's office and just sit down at an, un at an unworked, unlocked workstation? That could be a reason too, right? There's a lot of reasons that you might want to. The key is really that you want to place your sensors in spots that are either choke points or segments between networks. And you need to identify where they are. <coughs> so my, configur my configuration in my office right now runs this way. I'm mirroring all of my port traffic from port 1 and port 24 to port 23. And I have an IDS sensor listening. And there are actually three things wrong with this diagram. Does, does it make sense to mirror two ports to uh, port 23? Yeah. Can you mirror each port to a separate uh, one and then have different rules for different ports? You can. Because that you could have different types of the scenarios depending upon whether you're monitoring the network from the firewall or whether you're getting something from the, you suspect would most likely come from a workstation. Right, that's a good point. It also depends on the switch that you're using. Some switches can only do one mirroring port. That's, that's true as well. It depends a lot on the hardware. <coughs> Your configuration is going to see some traffic twice. Okay, that's a good point that I haven't thought of. Because if you have a workstation talking to the internet, depending on the implementation of the switch, you might get two copies of the packet. Good. How about sending uh, two two gigabits of data to a one gigabit switch port? <laughs> what do you think would happen? Would it be very accurate at detecting problems? Probably yeah, not. No one actually sends that much data. That's no true. It's, it's, the, it's theoretical, but it's something that you should consider. So a more effective solution might be something like what was mentioned earlier, where you install uh, a sensor on one port and mirror and, and you can kind of keep it separate so that you want to send each port that's mirrored to a different sensor. That would really be the more sensible solution. But there are actually at least two other problems with this diagram. And one of them isn't clear from the diagram, but one of the other ones should be. Does anyone see what they might be? All right, the one that's not clear from the diagram is uh, encrypted SSL traffic. So traffic encrypted at the application layer is not going to be decodable by Snort. 
And that means that your uh, workers who are sitting on Google Chat all day are not going to be able to see what they're talking about. And anything that uses SSL, you're not really going to know what's going on. Uh, the good news is that if you're hosting a sensitive server that has an SSL certificate on it and you want to protect that server, you can install an SSL proxy server and then install an IDS sensor between the proxy server and the data server. So that will help you. But as far as the workstations that are viewing uh, encrypted traffic all day, that's something that you're just not going to be able to watch with this technology. <coughs> Did you see the other problem? I don't remember what I was thinking. Um, wait, um, where about stuff going between the workstation and the servers? That was the other problem. Mm. Oh, between the workstations and the servers? Or those? Those are the only workstations. Uh, Sorry, go for it. Go that board. Within the, the, okay, the yeah. workstation. Or, or, oh, okay. server to server. That, that was the other problem. So right now you've got a bunch of servers that are all talking to each other on this switch and you're not monitoring their traffic. So the solution to this would be, you know, maybe you'll deploy 10 sensors, which is kind of ridiculous from a financial perspective and a management perspective. It's not very feasible. And in reality, Snort is not usable uh, to protect those systems on this switch which is why you need to use another technology, a host-based intrusion detection system. So the host-based intrusion detection system monitors and analyzes the internals of the host, which is a server or computer. It's very different from a network intrusion detection system. It's also very complementary. The NIDS, or the IDS, monitors the network traffic, but the HIDS actually monitors the local events that are taking place on your server. So sort of the end result of whatever that traffic might be. So OSEC is the one that I use in my office. It's an open source free of charge uh, system that's maintained by Trend Micro. There's an agent for OSEC for 15 operating systems on their website. I actually didn't even know that there were still that many operating systems around, but they have agents for almost everything. <coughs> <clears throat> so what can OSEC do? It's a system log reader. That sounds kind of boring. But the reality is that the way Linux and Windows works is there's a, there's a log generated for almost everything. So you think about Windows. you got the angry IT guy that you're about to fire, and he says, oh, I better go in and create a backdoor account for myself before they fire me so I can get back into the network after I've been fired. Well, that creates an event log in Windows, and probably in some versions of Linux, too. And that event log can be reported to you as an IT manager. And also, uh, the system is smart enough that it can kind of keep tabs of who's logged in. And it can notify you the first time a new user logs in, which is kind of a handy feature. It has a built-in file integrity checker. So when you install OSEC, it will build a checksum for every system file on your drive. And when that file changes, you'll receive a notification. And that's a really great security feature, except for on Windows Updates Day, or <laughs> when you have to uh, update your, your Linux distro. And you're going to receive tons of checksum errors, changes of uh, checksums that have been made. But it's still a good, under normal operating procedures, you wouldn't expect to see that sort of thing. So it's a good feature to have. So Windows Updates Day is the right day to attack. What's that? The so Windows Update Tuesday is the right day to attack. Yeah. <coughs> So it also detects rootkits, which is pretty handy because an intruder who breaks in may install a rootkit on your server um, that will help them get back into the system, allow them to persist in the network more easily. Uh, another wonderful Windows one is the registry monitoring. So it will report <laughs> registry changes to you, which um, you can expect to see often. So. <laughs> yeah. And OSEC now has, uh, it actually has always had active response where if it detects something going on, it can actually shut services off or block IP addresses. That feature has been available for Linux uh, machines for quite a while, but the new version of OSEC has also enabled you to use active response in Windows machines, which is pretty handy. On the file integrity checking, how does it maintain the consistency of its database of checksums there against possible compromise? Yes, I'll, I'll go over that in a moment. So anything that gets detected is called uh, is called an event, as opposed to snort, where anything that's detected is called an alert. So how does OSEC work? There has to be an OSEC server present. And unlike snort, 
OSEC server only runs on Linux distros, so it can't run on Windows or Mac. However, agents are installed on to 15 different types of, of uh, computers. So an agent gets installed on local machines that you're looking to monitor. An encryption key is generated uh, on the server for each host and then inputted into the, into the agent. So all of the traffic in between the agent and the server is encrypted pretty heavily. And there's a web interface and um, it has a built-in email server that will notify you of, of events that it finds. And to answer your question, the checksum, um, checksum values are all stored in the server. It has its own server that keeps track of a wide variety of things, checksums, but also like the first user login is one example that's stored in the database. And that's maintained. One thing I'll say about OSEC compared to Snort is you can install OSEC and have it completely up and running and totally functional in 20 minutes, as opposed to Snort, which is an all day project. So that, that's 20 minutes to getting all the false positives? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> that's I mean, never getting all the false uh, OSEC isn't as bad about false positives as Snort is. But uh, all of them will require some fine tuning. Yeah, if it's getting registered key updates. <laughs> Um, at least in the Linux world, we have this wonderful cryptographic chain of verification of checksums of packages and files. Yes. Does this take advantage of that? I don't know if it takes advantage of the cryptographic version, but I will tell you that when I run updates on my, my Linux servers, it does generate checksum changes and package installation. So if a new package is installed, I get a notification of that as well. So the United States could basically ignore anything that, you know, we got changed, but it's been verified that the package is signed, <coughs> and it's signed by your vendor. Well, the nice thing about either of these products is that the rules are very customizable, and it doesn't, it's really easy to write your own and sort of filter out the things that you don't want. So if you, you know, if you dig into it, you can get it to do it. And then my other question, my follow-up question, is, and I've been thinking about this for a while, is does Microsoft release checksums of their known good files? And if so, is there any way to leverage that so that you can basically say, instead of scanning my system to see if there's a signature of a bad virus file on there, why don't I just scan to see if all the files match the Microsoft release checksums? Yeah, well, from what I've seen of Microsoft, I've never seen two systems with the same file size on them. You know, it's like there's so many variations. So I don't know the answer to your question, but I wouldn't think that they make that sort of thing public. So this is the process that is uh, undertaken when there's an event that occurs in the local system. <coughs> it looks almost identical to Snort's processing, which because it, it pretty much is. <coughs> so with OSEC, we have two different types of rules. There's an atomic rule, which is based on a single uncorrelated event. So a user tries to access a file share and enters the wrong password. You get a, an alert for that. And it has a composite rule, and a composite rule is based on multiple correlated events. So using the same example that we just did, uh, a user enters the wrong password for a file share 10 times in a row from the same IP address. So that would be an example of a composite rule, which basically is a rule that builds on an atomic rule. This is a partial list of how OSEC categorizes their rule sets. I thought it was kind of interesting because just by looking at this, you can kind of see the areas that they've, that they've segregated their rules into. Unfortunately, I'm a mostly Windows shop, so most of mine come from the MS Auth rule table. But there's also, I get a lot of alerts for SSHD from people trying to break into my SSH uh, terminal at work. So I'm going to do uh, a couple of quick stories about how this technology has sort of helped me at my office, and then. A, brief tour of what the graphical interface of the systems looks like, and then we can do like a Q&A, and I'd also like to talk to everyone about what other technologies they're using for it. So, I don't know if anyone can read that, but I came to work after a nice long vacation, and I noticed this, this red highlighted set of alerts at the bottom of my screen. And from looking at this line, you can tell that, um, I don't think the mouse is showing this. Can you see that? So you can see that seven IP addresses sent, six, sent 67 fragmented packets to two IP addresses on my network. 
and this is the window. It's during a four-hour window on a Monday morning. And by using SMART and kind of digging into this, I was able to determine what the IP addresses were. And by typing the IP addresses into trustedsource.com, it tells you the geographic location in the internet carrier. So I found that this strange anomaly uh, took place from seven different locations, most of them on the east coast of the United States. They were scanning my terminal server and my exchange server for a four-hour window. The kind of odd thing about this is that there's one little anomalous spot Hi, and welcome to another searchsecurity.com screen test. My name is Tom Bowers. I'm a My apologies. <laughs> the, the kind of odd thing about this was that there's number five. It, it's really out of place, right? So everything took place on the east coast of the United States except for this one strange IP address from the UK that was also participating in this whatever it was they were doing. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting interesting thing. I'm wondering what they were trying to do. There's not a lot of information on what this tiny fragment error is. But, uh, is that a TVE link? What's that? Is that a TVE link? It is, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll show you guys that in a little yeah. bit. But um, he brought up a good point. These little links on down here, you can click on them to get more information about a type of alert. So if you ever wonder what something is, you can click on that and it will pull up a uh, it will pull up a description of what it is and how serious it is and how to protect yourself against it. I didn't try the CVE one, I did try the snort one, which for this alert was empty, so I got no information about what they were trying to do. Well it says attempted denial of service in second call. Mm. So just an interesting, like if I didn't have this software I wouldn't have known that happened. So you didn't set up for a specific signature for basically a part of the packet. What's that? You didn't s uh, set up a specific event or signature to detect this? No, uh, there are about 18,000 rules that come for free with Snort. And so there's a lot of them that are just junk and you have to disable, but this one is an order. Yeah. Um, a good example of OSEC, and I just thought this was kind of interesting too. I came in on December 3rd. And I found about 300 pages that looked like this in my alert log. And you can clearly tell what the, what the person was trying to do. You can see that they were trying to get into the IMAP server. You can see every <coughs> username that they tried to get in with. Yeah. And you can see the IP address that the person was trying to get in with. So. Looking for a old password. Yeah, I didn't go through the whole list, but I was kind of curious. Well, there's an administrator is a, is a legit one, right? But, So I want to go over a quick uh, demonstration of what the actual graphical interface looked like for these two programs. Particularly Snort, the OSEC graphical interface is not as good at all. So the front end for Snort is a program called <coughs> So the front end for Snort is a program called Base. Uh, previous to Base, it was something called um, Acid, which has been discontinued, but a lot of but a lot of documentation still refers to it. So this is what you see when you log in for the first time to Base. And basically what it's showing you is, here's the type of anomalous traffic it's detected. It puts it down into protocol for you. Uh, so we have the TCP traffic, UDP, ICMP, and port scan traffic. So you get a pretty quick barcode chart of the types of uh, anomalies that are being detected. Over here to the left, you see a list of the unique alerts, uh, the different categories that those alerts fall into, and then a total number of alerts that have been, that you see. 
On the right hand side, you'll see uh, use the archive database. Mm -hmm. So what I usually do is I'll kind of go through this list in the morning or whenever. And if it's a bunch of junk, I just take it and I move it into the archive database in case I need to look at it later. But I saved one interesting alert that I thought you guys would like to see. So I'm going to use the archive database here. And I'm going to click at, on the unique alerts. And <coughs> and you'll see down here a social security number was transmitted, or in my case, 120 social security numbers were transmitted. So a lot of websites use series sequences of numbers that very closely correspond to social security numbers. So a lot of these will be false alerts, but this top one actually turned out not to be a false alert. So I can tell the source IP address of where this social security number got transmitted from and where it wound up. And where it wound up was on my Exchange server. That's the IP address for my Exchange server. You can get a lot more information about the alert and the packet by clicking on the ID for it. And this will tell you, this will actually show you the payload of the packet. Now you look at this and you say, well, that doesn't help me at all. But you can click on plain display, and it will actually convert it to plain display. So I found out that one of my coworkers' fathers is very anti Barack Obama. He decided to email Barack Obama's social security number to his son in our office and talk about how bad he is. And here it is. So you have to do a little detective work to find out what this is, but I have caught a couple of people transmitting social security numbers in plain text that should not have, and I've had to you know, track them down and talk to them about it. So this is a pretty handy feature of SNORT to be able to examine the packets <coughs> in such detail, and they stay in there forever, so that you can always go back to it. So just brief overview of what a daily set of alerts look like over here you saw the ID number, which allows you to examine the contents of the packet. And then the signature name, if you click on the Snort link, it will pull up a pretty detailed, in most cases, description of what the alert is, how serious it is, what type of system it affects, and what you can do to prevent your system from being vulnerable from this type of alert. And then it has the timestamp, the source address, and the destination <coughs> address. So now it's only tracking, if you have an attachment to an email that has sensitive information in it, it's not going <coughs> to translate that because it's in another language. Email is a very, a, a very big challenge because a lot of times it's encrypted between the client and the server. Right. Um, so most of the time it, it's more of an anomaly when I actually catch a social security number being transmitted via email. This I don't know how this one came through that way. but. Um, Email systems themselves have that scanning capability, at least I know that Exchange does. You can put a policy in effect that will scan for these sorts of policy violations. And in a lot of cases, if the software that you're using has that capability, it's better to use that software to take, a, to take action against this type of event than to use something like Snort. And that's why I'm hesitant to put Snort in inline mode, because I wouldn't want something like that being blocked. I would rather do it through the Exchange server where it's, con where it's in a controlled block environment instead of just dropping packets that are being transmitted. Um, so that's the, the, um, that's the base engine for, for Snort. It's kind of basic. Snort by itself doesn't, doesn't do emails. <coughs> you can kind of tell that you wouldn't want to get an email for every one of these alerts. Because <laughs> this is just since this morning. And this is kind of a light day because there's no one in the office. So. Um, you can you can modify this and kind of get rid of a lot of the false positives, but it's not very flexible. And I'll show you the. Um, Do you pay for Snort? No, I downloaded the source code. Uh, it's it's a freebie. Um, the commercial version is like light years ahead. It does unbelievably great things, but you know not everyone has the fifteen thousand that they can. Yeah shell out on it. And I, and I actually think that this product, even though it's free and very limited, it really provides a valuable service because 
these things aren't, aren't things you would see if you didn't have something there listening to it. <coughs> so OSEC has a web, uh, a web-based front end that I'll show you guys. It's really slow and terrible. But OSEC will send email alerts, and they're a lot more limited than Snort. Like, you won't get 200 false alarms a day. So I would recommend uh, the email solution rather than the, the web-based solution. But up here on the left-hand side, you can see the available agents. I know it's really small. I'm trying to magnify it. But you can see the available agents that, uh, that I have the OSEC agent installed on. So I haven't installed on my servers. It shows all a list of all the files that have the last been modified. Uh, and this goes back indefinitely. Unfortunately, the OSEC never cleans out its database, so the web interface takes forever to do anything. Uh, and here's a list of the latest events. Another unfortunate side effect of this website is that you see uh, this rule level right here, level three. OSEC arranges its, its alert levels in a scale of severity from one to 15, <coughs> where one is the lowest. Normally what you would want to do is you would say, e send me an email for any event with a severity level of seven or eight or nine or 10 or higher. But this web interface shows you everything. Like a level three event is just no one cares. So, um, what's that? PHP one. Yeah, I mean these are one like you get a million. Of, there's literally a million of them in here, and, and you can't get rid of them. So OSEC, while it's a really great program and really easy to install, and have a really great value for free, their web interface is not good, and it's actually a, a, an add-on product. It doesn't even come with it, so you have to kind of download it. Install it yourself. So that's pretty much a uh, an overview of the two intrusion detection systems that I was going to present. So I'll take some questions, and then I'd like to see what you guys are using for intrusion detection. A few people that raised their hands. Uh, some time ago, I was looking at looking at Snort, I guess, and came across this other product called Open Bas V A S, um, which, as I understood it, was a branch of Snort when Snort got expensive or something. And I was just wondering if you had heard of this and used it at all and looked at it. I hadn't, but I'm interested in it because the free version of Snort that they give you, it has a lot of really strange limitations. I always thought that Snort <coughs> would be a great project to take and fork into another project. It's Open Vast, you said? Open VAS. Okay. Let's take a look at that. <coughs> Any other questions? Do you know if there are plans to implement like a ma friendly managed emitter attack principles in the inline modes that Snort or the source wire or these products could, could see inside encrypted protocols like SSH, SSL? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, this, the open source one is very limited compared to what the uh, commercial one will give you. And uh, my friend and I actually have a seminar lined up for the commercial one. So if you ask me tomorrow, I might know the answer to that, but I don't know. Okay. What's everyone else using for IDS? There were a couple of people that raised their hands. <coughs> commercial firewall in an IDS description. What brand is it, do you mind? Ostaro. What is it? Ostaro. What is it? <coughs> I think you said a styro, which is a firewall. Okay. Uh, I, I do have a question. Um, with all this data that you're collecting, um, if you're in an environment that has uh, privacy issues, does Thorpe or OSEC uh, take into consideration those issues? What you have to do to secure the server the world is potentially sensitive information is stored. Yeah, that, act, that thought actually crossed my mind for the first time today. Okay. I think <laughs> I never really considered it before, but um, yeah, I mean, as you guys can see, I'm just in a regular web page with no SSL here. So this I mean, you were reading this guy's email, and potentially other kinds of things could come up as well. Yeah, I know. Um, if you're asking, you know, Exchange doesn't let an administrator read someone's email. Uh, there's no such setting, to my knowledge, on Snort. It lets you view the raw packet. And sort of have to. What's that? Sort of have to. Yeah, and you know there are better tools for for looking through people's email than Snort. You know, it's, 
like if you want to look for something sensitive, then you should probably be using the exchange policies that are built in. But um, to answer your question, I, I don't think there's a way to shut that off. And your thought is very good. You should really make sure that the web interfaces for these systems are secure somehow. Is there a way you say, is there a configuration file for Snore where you can, can you access it over SSL? Is it just something where, you know, by default it's open on AD? Apache. Okay. Right, it uses Apache, so you can use an SSL certificate to protect the base interface or, um, you know, mine is open to the outside world because I'm here. Uh, and I figured that the terminal server was going to respond slowly. Um, but normally, maybe you wouldn't want this sort of thing being available from outside. Yeah. Particularly if it has any uh, SQL injection problem. Yeah, I've actually been seeing a lot of alerts on SQL injection lately. It's mostly from the workstations. And you may see them tomorrow for attacks on that. <laughs> so again, the, the kind of nice thing about OSEC is that it really, um, like if, a, if someone gets into your system and they try to make a modification, that's, that's where this product really shines. It will, it will really make it so that you see that. And if you didn't have this, then someone might go in and make an account and be in your system for weeks and you would never know, unless you're really looking for logs. And I well, didn't notice in the list of things that OSEC monitors, um, does it look at SC Linux um, events as well? Uh, does it agree at all with, with that functionality? SE Linux, so the Linux firewall. Uh, the, the SE Linux is the, the kernel based stuff that this yeah. allows various things or Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that. I can just check and see if there's any, like, this is a list of all the logs that it supports. You can, pay, you can pretty much configure one and anything with OSEC. Pretty much what happened to OSEC is that you can put in regular expressions to look at, for example, where logs appear. So if SE Linux log is an any log, you can pretty much one with OSEC. Okay. And the rules are really, <coughs> the rules are really complicated, but you can write very specific rules to look, with OSEC particularly, to look for almost any type of thing that will show up in the logs. It's, it's pretty impressive. Anyone else have an idea system? I know you said you were using the SourceFire commercial one, right? Yeah, but I wasn't working with him, so pretty much anything is about the code. I worked with even and the team responsible for SourceFire, they pretty much not anyone. They didn't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah. I think that the likelihood is that some people here may have IDS systems on their network and might just not know it. It's not the sort of thing that upper management will necessarily tell anyone. So it had the uh, lower capacity version tripwire. It's a, more of an OSEC that thing would monitor to change files. And oh, that, that became, that became uh, cumbersome after a while. Can't remember. Tripwire and it and it, mod it looked for modified system files. Yeah. Did it use an agent like OSEC? Oh, this was Linux based. I don't I don't, I don't think it was just machine based. I mean, it was on the machine we were using. I don't know if it was capable of monitoring other machines outside of its own. It's an IDS. Hmm? It's it's an IDS. Yeah. I hadn't heard of it. I've you used uh, ISS. ISS? Yeah. Internet Security Scan. Is that a commercial solution? Commercial. Yeah, for purchase. What's the cost? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was pricing out some of the source fire solutions, and they were scoping out at like twenty-four thousand dollars. <coughs> the uh, the fifteen thousand um, dollar source fire one. It comes with a, a sensor that has four NIC cards in it. So you can plug it in uh, in protection mode into two spots or in monitor mode into four spots. And uh, to purchase an additional one of those was $7,000 more. So there's the markup on these are huge. And, and the salespeople yeah. told me, well, we could probably reduce that 20% 20, 20 for you off from list. So you know that there's high over. We use uh, Snort and then we also use Argus for logging flows. It's, it's more just about flow logging and seeing who talks to where, not about inspecting the contents of the packet. It's Argus? Yeah. Is it an open source? Yes. 
but that's it, it's nice to be able, it's more performance as far as just being basically log and just flow. So it's nicer in some cases to be able to just see that someone, you know, in the basically basic types of traffic like IP, UDP, TCP, uh, nothing beyond that. So it's good to be able to see, you know, what's going on where and when, but maybe not exactly to the level of detail, but it's like I said, it performs a little better. And I think Snort could use a little less detail in some cases. It shows you so much stuff, but it does give you a great overview of where traffic is flowing. <coughs> like we turned it on on a network uh, over the weekend and started to see, you know, people set up devices in different sites to continuously ping each other to make sure everything's working correctly and start seeing those sorts of things. And you know that you set them up a year ago, but sort of forget that they're there. So it's a good use for it. Thank you. Thank you.